My name is Daniel Blomberg. I'm an attorney with the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and I'm on the leadership team for the Charleston Federalist Society Lawyers Chapter. I'd like to welcome you all to this joint of event of the Federalist Society Lawyers Chapters of not only Charleston, but also Columbia and Greenville. And I'd like to welcome our special guest, Misha Saitlin of Troutman Pepper. Uh, before joining Troutman, Misha was the Solicitor General of the state of Wisconsin. He clerked for Judges Alex Kaczynski and Janice Rogers Brown and for Justice Anthony Kennedy. He now leads Troutman's nation, National Appellate and Supreme Court practice and has argued several cases before the Supreme Court and is going to be talking to us today about a win that he obtained before the Supreme Court just before Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Eve. It's a very exciting case. And, uh, and he's gonna set the stage for us, talk about the, the COVID-19 restrictions and situations that were going on nationwide and how this litigation that he was successful in was the culmination of a variety of cases on this issue. Uh, one item of business before we dive in and turn it over to Misha to lead us throughout the discussion. Um, if you are a South Carolina lawyer and are interested in getting CLE credit, please listen carefully. We will need you to indicate your attendance by clicking on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and then submitting a question that consists of your name and your bar number. As a matter of privacy, that question will only be visible to the moderators. We're going to gather up all the names and bar numbers that are submitted on the question function and submit them to the South Carolina CLE Commission for your credit once we get that, um, once we get accreditation approved. Uh, we will also, during the course of the event, two more times, we will ask you to re-enter your name and bar number. So about halfway through and at the end, ask you to re-enter your name and bar number so we can affirm to the, the CLE Commission that you participated and that you can get credit. If you, well, are you guys are no joke here. <laughs> we're trying to get, make sure everybody gets the value out of this. Um, if you are participating via phone and not at your computer, you can participate in the poll by sending me an email now with your name and bar number and then resending it to me when you hear the prompts midway and at the end. So you can either do it on the Q&A function, easiest way, or you can send me an email. My email address is D, as in Daniel, Blomberg, B-L-O-M-B-E-R-G, at BeckettLaw.org, B-E-C-K-E-T-L-A-W.org. So either of those two ways, that's how you get your credit. And without wasting any more time, let me turn it over to Misha so he can tell us about this fascinating case that he won at the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I will get to that case near the back end of my presentation, but the real reason I do these presentations is to encourage everyone to challenge the unprecedented overreach that the government is doing in state court and federal court. So I'm gonna kind of talk about what I've been doing on this front and how it's been really successful and hopefully end up with the, talking about the Supreme Court case and what's gonna follow. And hopefully that will encourage some of you guys who are able with your, with your work to do them to bring some of these challenges. Now, if you think back a calendar year ago, and someone told you that bureaucrats or your governors would be able to close your places of worship, close your kids' schools, make you stay at home, basically put your business out of business, all at a flick of a pen, without any legislation being passed, and further, that most people would just be happy to take it and wouldn't want to push back in court. I think you would think not in the United States of America. Well, obviously we all know what happened in early spring, COVID-19 hit, there was a lot of fear, and there was a lot of wholesale restrictions on, on our liberty. At first people were scared, understandably, they didn't push back. And then people started saying, well, is this right? Is this consistent with our constitutional structure and our rule of law? And so some lawyers started bringing some cases. And a lot of these cases had to do with restrictions on religious liberty. And these cases were brought in, in April and May, and then they culminated in an unfortunate outcome in, in the South Bay case at the U.S. Supreme Court. In that case, the, the United States Supreme Court, by a 5-4 vote, denied an injunction pending appeal um, from challenging an order that uh, restricted places of religious worship more harshly than secular gatherings. Now the Supreme Court denies petitions and requests for emergency relief all the time. You know, a denial there 
wouldn't have had a lot of meaning generally. But unfortunately, uh, the Chief Justice decided to write a separate concurring opinion. And in that concurring opinion, he reached back 100 years and cited this case, Jacobson. Jacobson dealt with a mandatory vaccination law. And by mandatory vaccination law, I mean someone had to either get vaccinated or pay five bucks. Now, it's more than five bucks today because of inflation, but it was, it was that choice. And in, in that unenumerated rights challenge, the Supreme Court held that, that rational basis applies, which you know, makes sense in an unenumerated rights context, at least under a lot of people's lights. But the Chief Justice cited that Jacobson opinion and said that public health officials have a lot of deference in the pandemic. And so unfortunately, lower courts thereafter took that and ran with it. And it became kind of this mantra that whenever you challenge any extraordinary limitation on your liberty and your constitutional rights, including your enumerated constitutional rights, district courts and court of appeals, courts of appeals started citing South, the Chief Justice's opinion in South Bay and the 100 years ago de decision in Jacobson to basically give uh, local bureaucrats and governors carte blanche. So those of us who were not ready to just allow our liberty to be taken for however long a vaccine would take, uh, we largely started pivoting to state court where South Bay and Jacobson maybe have less purchase. And I did several of these lawsuits, uh, which were pretty successful. We first had a couple of uh, challenges to school closures uh, that were gonna carry over into the fall. And, and there, were, there were two here, and we chose completely two very different legal strategies based upon the forum we were facing. First, um, Dane County, Wisconsin, closed all private and public schools for the fall. Uh, and for those of you who don't know Dane County, it's like 20 miles surrounded by reality. If Bernie Sanders ran against Ronald Reagan in Dane County, he would win like 80-20. That's the kind of place that Dane County is. And so even though we have a Democrat governor, he wasn't going to close schools for the fall in our purple state. But Dane County being so blue and in the tank for all shutdowns all the time, they decided to close schools. Now, Wisconsin, those of you who litigate in the religious liberty realm, Wisconsin has rejected the rational basis Smith standard and has long ago adopted the strict, scru strict scrutiny uh, Sherber test, even after Smith. So the, the claim we brought in Wisconsin was on behalf of a bunch of Catholic primary and secondary schools. And um, we said that this restriction shutting down our schools burdened our religious exercise, communal prayer with the kids and all of that, and that this was subject to strict scrutiny. And of course, this couldn't satisfy strict scrutiny. We got a stay from our state Supreme Court um, and so our schools have been open all fall. And, you know, there were also some state administrative law grounds that aren't going to be interesting to you guys, but our schools have been open. We had an oral argument on the merits last week. The decision will be issued in due course, but the bottom line is our schools have been opened as a result of that lawsuit. We also had a, a client who was a Catholic all boys high school in California. Obviously, California state courts aren't going to care about religious liberty, certainly aren't going to give you that higher Sherbert life protection. But you know what California courts do care about and what California Supreme Court precedent does support? The right of poor children to get a substantial equal education to the, to the right of, of more well-off children. Now, uh, we're talking about rejecting U.S. Supreme Court precedent, just like the Wisconsin Supreme Court has rejected Smith, the California Supreme Court has rejected Rodriguez and held that there is a constitutional right under the free, under the Equal Protection Clause to an equal education. So in our school, the mass majority, the majority of our students are on uh, significant financial aid. So we had plaintiffs who were um, parents who are of lower means who were saying, we can't afford these Zoom, we can't afford the uh, fancy pods that the rich parents are doing. We can't afford to send our kids to Cowes County lines. So this is going to give our kids a substandard education. Now, before we ever got to a preliminary injunction ruling, they allowed our school to reopen. But this shows the different strategies that we used. In Wisconsin, we, we fronted religious liberty because that's what the jurisdiction's precedent supported. In California, we fronted 
a right to equal education because that's what the jurisdiction's um, case law supported. And next, and this is actually a case that I argued earlier today. Uh, we brought a lawsuit on behalf of a small uh, bar in northern Wisconsin um, challenging the governor's capacity limitations on bars and restaurants. And the challenge there was based on some state administrative law grounds that y'all won't be that interested in, although I will say that we did win in the Court of Appeals, and so the, uh, the capacity limits have been blocked in Wisconsin statewide uh, for as long as they've been attempted to be in place. <laughs> but what's important to know in that case is that when this case was originally brought, we had our client, which is a small bar in northern Wisconsin, and then we had this big association represented by somebody else of taverns, the Tavern League. And the Tavern League, after an unfortunate decision by the trial court, folded to the political pressure of the governor, did not appeal. Whereas uh, our, little, our little bar in Avery, Wisconsin, did appeal and got that injunction that benefited all the members of the uh, Tavern League. And that shows the importance of getting a, uh, a client that's willing to stick it through, willing to fight on, uh, and isn't going to bow to political pressure. Now we did bring one federal case during this period, even though we had South Bay and Jacobson. And this is maybe my personally favorite case of the whole bunch. Uh, there was a, a mutual friend who had, who had a, uh, uh, his friend uh, had a brother who's significantly intellectually disabled. And this brother for 20 years had been working at this uh, packaging facility um, under a program for disabled people for the state where he would package uh, parts for, for Caterpillar. And, and this gave him a lot of um, kind of structure in his life, gave him a lot of uh, feeling of accomplishing something every single day. And then when the pandemic hit in March, the packaging plant was closed, like a lot of things were closed. Uh, and, but then things started reopening. Governor, the governor of Illinois allowed uh, the packaging plant to reopen, but he didn't restart the disability program. So the, the able-bodied folks were in their packaging, but the disabled folks were not. I learned about this. I said, this seems like a very clear violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. You're letting able-bodied people do something, but not the disabled. And my theory was that South Bay and Jacobson certainly can't apply to reasonable accommodations under the ADA. So I sent a letter on, on um, the disabled individual's behalf to the governor's bureaucrats said, surely you can't mean that you can exclude disabled people when you're letting able-bodied people in, that it's safe for able-bodied people, why not disabled people? And I got back this remarkable uh, letter, which is close to a discriminatory smoking gun as you'll find these days. He said, yeah, we meant that, we can't trust disabled people to wear masks, uh, you're, you're not gonna be allowed back in. So I said, okay, we'll see you in court. We sued uh, under the ADA. Uh, we had a preliminary injunction hearing. The judge let the state know what she thought of this mask's rationale. Uh, and then lo and behold, they let my client back in to his job nine days after we brought suit. Now the fun thing about having an ADA claim is unlike other 1983 claims, you can get damages. So we still have that case going. Hopefully we'll set some good precedent uh, for the future. Um, but uh, the important part is we fought the governor. It was uh, clearly illegal. And you see what happens when you punch a bully in the face, sometimes they back down, especially when the law is clearly on your side. And that brings us to kind of the main event that you guys probably want to hear is the, uh, the uh, diocese case. Our clients in that case are a bunch of Orthodox Jewish synagogues. They have been complying for a long time with the generally applicable rules on capacity limits. And um, unfortunately, the governor decided to make us a target. He, for some reason, he decided that Orthodox Jews were causing the spread of COVID-19 in certain parts of New York. So on top of the generally applicable capacity restrictions, he added yet new restrictions targeted to certain um, primarily Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods. Of course, those neighborhoods had other uh, establishments, including some churches, which, which is where the diocese got involved. But based on his press conferences, it's clear that Orthodox Jews and the worship of Orthodox Jews was his target. And uh, the reason we felt that we could bring this lawsuit and perhaps win, even notwithstanding South Bay and Jacobson in federal court was three considerations. One, 
the governor had made pretty clearly discriminatory statements. Uh, governor Cuomo had made clearly, pretty clearly discriminatory statements saying that he was targeting Orthodox Jews. Under Masterpiece Cake Shop, that would seem to take it out of whatever box uh, the Chief Justice thought in South Bay. Second, the restrictions here were frankly crazy. Uh, whereas most restrictions are based on capacity and they try to um, allow social distancing, most of the restrictions uh, here were tied to 10 people or 25 people for the entire synagogue. So that means that if you have a synagogue that's 1,000 people, 10 people. You have a synagogue that seats 40 people, 10 people. That's far more restrictive than anything that, that South Bay dealt with. And then three, uh, we had had a, a different uh, composition of the Supreme Court since South Bay. Amy, Cor Amy Coney Barrett was on the court. And South Bay was not itself president of the court. It was a one justice concurrence and an unpublished, you know, kind of decision. So we weren't, you know, the, the court didn't need to overcome stare decisis. It, it could consider the issues afresh. So those were our considerations. We brought a lawsuit in district court. Uh, we kind of knew that it was going to be a tough lift in district court, um, given, you know, South Bay and what district courts in the, in the country had been doing. The diocese brought their own parallel lawsuit, ended up in front of different judges. Same result. We both went up on appeal. In the Second Circuit, we got a one, we got, we lost two to one, but we got a one just uh, judge dissent from Judge Park, who had some great language at the state posture. Then we went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And there, an incredibly gratifying decision, the Supreme Court ruled in our favor and blocked these unconstitutional restrictions. Now, there are several aspects to the Supreme Court's decision that are particularly heartening. One, they went fairly broad. You know, we had this really powerful theory that Governor Cuomo was targeting us in particular. Under Masterpiece Cake Shop, that's pretty clearly illegal. But if the court had done that, our clients would have been happy, would have vindicated our rights, but it wouldn't have had as much impact uh, for other religious adherents where they didn't have governors that were targeting particular religious adherents. So the fact that they focused on the broader theory of discriminating between places of worship on one hand and secular places on the other really helped with our situation uh, for, for uh, the future. Second uh, um, gratifying thing is that nowhere in the decision, in the court's majority decision, where South Bay and Jacobson even mentioned. And I think that's a powerful signal that normal constitutional apl apl law applies uh, even during a pandemic. No more special exceptions for um, Jacobson or anything like that. You apply strict scrutiny or strict scrutiny applies. And, and another thing that was really heartening is while the decision was 5-4 you know, in the formal uh, way the court issued it, it was really more 5-2 uh, because only uh, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan said that we, sh we did not have a powerful constitutional claim. Uh, the Chief Justice and um, Justice Breyer both wrote separately that they didn't want to give us our requested injunction because Governor Cuomo at the last minute had changed where some of the zones were. And, he didn't, and, they didn't, and those two justices didn't think that relief for us in the emergency posture was necessary in light of those last second changes. But those justices did voice significant sympathy for our position. So we might have a broader coalition for religious liberty in the time of pandemic than the press would have suggested. Some of the concurring opinions were also very heartening. The Justice Gorsuch's opinion had some amazing phrases. The Constitution should not shelter in place during, during a pandemic. Fantastic phrase. He also threw a lot of shade at uh, Jacobson and South Bay as they would apply to enumerated constitutional rights. Justice Kavanaugh also had a great concurring opinion where he talked about if you're going to start making exceptions for secular conduct, you have to make uh, exceptions for religious conduct, constitutionally protected conduct. The Constitution, when you're talking about exceptions, has to be a most favored, not a least favored, not a me medium favored uh, provision. Or, or a document. So that is, you know, what happened now. What's going to happen in the future? We're obviously back on the second, back in the second circuit on the merits. That argument is is being uh, going to be argued expertly tomorrow by my colleague Avi Shik and, and and Daniel helped us with a moot court yesterday, which we greatly uh, appreciated. 
Um, and But our decision has already been cited by courts around the country. The Ninth Circuit, just two days ago, struck down uh, capacity, uh, capacity limits on, on religious worship that weren't being uh, applied to secular institution, uh, citing our case. And other courts are starting to ask for supplemental briefing on our case. Uh, so we hope that this will be a sea change for um, the right, not only religious liberty rights, but constitutional rights. Because of course the pandemic is, looks like it's coming to a close with the shipment of these vaccines. But if we don't get the good case law now, before that finishes, and that we have all of these terrible decisions from all these circuit courts that have cited South Bay and Jacobson laying around like, like loaded guns, so the next time we have a public health or other kind of emergency, uh, it's gonna be a really bad time for the Constitution and our rights. So I would urge those of you who can, within your practices, bring these lawsuits, whether they're paid or pro bono, or discounted or whatever, to do so. Because we need to establish good case law now while we can, and we need to protect our constitutional rights while they are still under assault, even in the waning days, hopefully, of the pandemic. And those are kind of my overall remarks, and I'm glad to, to hear any follow-up questions, or Daniel might have some further remarks on that. Great, thank you so much, Misha. Yeah, so what we'll do now is we'll ask, I'll ask Misha some questions. I think we're gonna bring in Miles Coleman from the Columbia chapter in a minute to talk about some of the amicus practice uh, that happened at the US Supreme Court. And then after we get through that, we will have a time for questions. So anybody in the audience who wants to ask a question, you can use that same Q&A function that you're using to uh, register for CLE credit. Just throw in a question there, we'll keep an eye on it and we'll try to get it asked here near the end. Um, let me go ahead and remind you now to uh, to go ahead and put in your uh, your name and bar number in the CLE sec in the Q and A section, just so that we can uh, again affirm that you are here the whole time. And uh, or you can shoot me an email, dblomberg at beckettlaw.org. Misha, one of the things I'd like us to uh, like you to talk about a little more is just how high a standard did you have to meet to get the Supreme Court to get you um, relief? in the case that you won right on the eve of Thanksgiving. I mean, I think I was, it was midnight, um, where or just for midnight, uh, Wednesday night. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like you counted it. <laughs> but just before Thanksgiving, everybody's getting ready for Turkey and you got a victory. So tell us about what, what a high standard you had to meet and what, what, signif what that means as far as the significance of the decision. Yeah, to get, we, we were asking for an injunction pending appeal, which is outside of, you know, unusual mandamus, that is the highest standard you can reach. And so there's no, there could be no argument in discussing our case that somehow when you get to a case on the merits, final judgment, permanent injunction, that somehow the Supreme Court's decision uh, it was done at a, a some sort of lower standard. So it is at the highest ebb so that applying it for injunction relief, you know, that's going to be a lesser standard. Applying it for final, just the final judgment, that's going to be a lesser standard still. So it is a quite uh, heartening to get the win under that standard. But I also think that shows that folks should not be scared to go to the Supreme Court. They do articulate the standard in a very robust way. But you know, we, you know, earlier this year, I got a stay in an election case where the lower court had changed some of the Wisconsin election laws, also from the US Supreme Court. I'd gotten stays in the past. So the US Supreme Court does use that mechanism to send a signal to lower courts about what it wants them to do. Uh, it's kind of ca called the shadow docket. So while formally it is a high standard, it is a tool the Supreme Court is using increasingly these days to send signals to the lower courts about how it wants certain recurring issues handled, especially issues that come up really quickly and the Supreme Court can not adjudicate each and every one. And so I think that's incredibly important. So you, you, you got the Supreme Court to say that you had an indisputably clear right to relief. And that's, I mean, like you said, that's a much higher standard than would be necessary to win a preliminary injunction, to win final judgment. And, uh, and you, you got that. And again, while judges, uh, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts and uh, Justice Breyer were procedurally didn't come along for the 5-4 the decision, they also, like you were saying earlier, they didn't say that they had a problem with the merits. In fact, Chief Justice Roberts said several times in his in his dissent that he thinks that there was there is a First Amendment problem there. Um, so a really good sign, very strong precedent. And uh, when the Ninth Circuit's decision that just came out the other day in the Calvary Chapel uh, uh, case, I think that one they said it was a the the Diocese of Brooklyn decision is a seismic change 
uh, in favor of First Amendment rights uh, during the, con- the course of this pandemic. So very, very significant. Talk to us about, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but talk to us about your clients and in terms of, uh, I mean, we, we've all seen the stories, right, of the houses of worship that are, are flouting any sort of reasonable standard that they're packing people in, and not just houses of worship, but other types of in- institutions as well. But there have been several that have hit the headlines saying that we're just going to do whatever we want. We're not. We're going to. We're going to act like there is no COVID nineteen pan- pandemic. Um, that's not what your clients were doing, is it? That's right. I and mean, it's really important when you are bringing these cases to make sure you're careful with your clients. Uh, to have clients that follow all the rules that are not being challenged, that can show that they've done it safely. Now that's what we had in, in our case. But I also, also what I've had in all those other cases that I've talked about. You know, in the schools cases, we had schools that had summer programs where they had basically test run their safety plans. They had spent tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars adding new facilities, adding adding new ventilation, air filtration. And those kind of optics are very, very important. Uh, You know, when we when we were looking for clients and all, you know, in these cases, we obviously had a couple of clients that were willing to go. And he said, should we get more synagogues? Should we get more schools? I'm not going to talk about uh, which conversations were had in which case. But each time we said, yes. But if you're going to get more in the case, they have to make sure that they've had a good safety record, that they comply with everything that they're not challenging, and that everything else w- there is kind of all the, all the corners are squared. Because that's really important. Because if you get, let's say, a, a lawsuit with seven, seven churches or seven schools or seven synagogues, and six of them are beyond reproach, and the seventh one's got some issues, you can bet your bottom dollar the bureaucrats' lawyers are going to focus on that seventh exclusively, and that's going to make it harder for you to win your case. Yeah, I, th- I think that's incredibly important, both from the perspective of, of winning the litigation and also from the perspective of not giving religious liberty and constitutional rights a black eye, right? If you're rushing into the court and you're, def- you're defending rights that looks like are going to make other people sick, then that's going to be a harder sell for the, the general public. But when it's folks like your clients in the, the, the diocese there, where the Supreme Court went out of its way to say there are zero reported cases of transmission in any of these institutions and that they've worked very hard to be safe. I mean, th- one of the nice things about working in religious practice, this is something I do, is a lot of times my clients are very, very conscientious people. And they think that, you know, protecting human life and treating other people with dignity and respect and protecting their, their health is extraordinarily important. So they're not looking to cause trouble. They're just looking, as would be the case here, they're looking to be treated equally and fairly. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to use the magic of technology to let everyone see just how bad an actor uh, Governor Cuomo was here. So I'm going to pull up the, oh, let's see, maybe I won't. Host disabled participant. Alessandra, if you're hearing me, is there any way that you could let me share my screen? Um, because I have a map I want to show everybody of uh what an outlier uh, the governor of New York was here. So while we're, while we're waiting to see if we can pop that up. Yeah, there we go. Thank you so much. All right. I uh, here we go. And hopefully I'm going to do it right. All right. So everybody should be able to see the screen, which is a web a Beckett website. It's a, a, a page that we have on the COVID-19 issues and religious liberty. And you can see this quote from the wall street journal. It says churches are asking for equal treatment not special treatment. That's just as true for synagogues and mosques and other houses of worship. And as we scroll down here, you can see that there are, across the country, there's actually uh, overwhelmingly the the state governments have fairly uh, respectful limitations on worship. In fact, in 32 of the states, there are no restrictions on the ability of folks to get together to worship together safely. And, um, you know, there are restrictions regarding social distancing and things like that, but there are no house of worship specific limitations at the state level in 32 of the states that you see on your screen. You'll see that New York is not one of those states. It's not even one of the yellow states, it's one of the red states. One of the states that was imposing a numerical cap. And uh, as we scroll down here a little further, you can see on the far left-hand side, New York joined California in being the worst offender when it came to kind of the, the kind of restrictions on house of worship. And this map is a map that's been updated since the, the, the win in Misha's case. This is a map that reflects that the crazy restrictions have actually been improved somewhat. Um, the, the restrictions that Misha were challenging 
limited access to a house of worship to 10 people, no matter the size, or 25 people, no matter the size, depending on the zone you were in. Um, you know, I, you're being a little modest here. I just want to say that when the time we got to the Supreme Court, we were challenging it. Beckett was our co-counsel at the U.S. Supreme Court. And this is the kind of information that we didn't really have at the lower courts that we were able to marshal in front of the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, I think, did note how unduly restricted these were compared to other states. And so we teamed up with Beckett at the U.S. Supreme Court. And them bringing this information to us was really helpful. Well, and I think that's exactly right, Misha. I think that the, when the Supreme Court saw that New York was an outlier, and so they were not, not just the discriminatory statements of Governor Cuomo, the fact that nobody in the country was doing the thing they were doing, the house of worship, at a time when transmission levels in the city of New York were lower than they were in most of the rest of the country, that made, that made it a much easier case to get to the right result. Yeah, so I'm gonna come off of our screen sharing now. Um, and uh, let, me, let me invite Miles Coleman to come in and talk to us a little bit about some of the amicus strategy that took place at the Supreme Court and that got the Supreme Court to, to arrive at the right result. Sure, uh, Misha, thanks for, for being with us again. Um, so for, for, for background for, for folks who are, who are with us watching, uh, in, I think this is true both of the, the diocese of Brooklyn and then sort of the, I'll call it a companion case for lack of a better term, the, the synagogues, the Agatha Israel case, there were, I think, in each of them, maybe like six to eight amicus briefs, which, as a general matter, is a lot fewer than it would have been had these cases arisen at Supreme Court in the normal course of business, right? If this, if this were uh, Fulton versus Philadelphia or any of the other sort of hot First Amendment cases, there would have been, what, 60, 70, 80 amicus briefs. But because of the compressed time frame um, and some of the, you know, the, the exigencies of the circumstance, a, a much smaller number. I think, and I haven't actually done, gone and, and counted noses, but I think of the, let's say there's about seven, I think there was maybe five, four or five uh, supporting the good guys. Uh, it might have been four for the good guys, three for the bad guys, something like that. Um, that's the background. Here, here's kind of the question. Um, if, if, if you have an answer or if you have any thoughts on this. I thought it was interesting. First of all, because of the, the haste at which this was done, uh, none of the amici were able to, in accordance with the normal rules, uh, get the consent in advance, right? You've got to get the 10-day consent from, from the parties in order to file your amicus brief without a motion. So everybody, all, all seven of the amici, had to move for permission to file the brief and file the brief as well. The court never granted or denied any of those motions. Technically, I, I suppose they were all mooted by the decision. What, what, what's the thinking, if you have any? What's the answer? Why, why did the court not grant any of those, especially in light of the fact that some of the dissenters cited to, quoted from, and relied on some of the amicus briefing. Any, uh, any thoughts on the, on sort of the, the non-granting or denial motions? I mean, I think that's pretty standard. I mean, they, they you know, they're, wor they're worried about deciding the case. They're not really as worried about you know, what to do with the amicus, but I do think the amicus briefs were, were exceptionally important. Um, and you know, we, we cited to them, you know, one of my favorite ones was the, uh, was the brief from the um, uh, certain Muslim organizations that were talking about how religious minorities were targeted often uh, as, as bl to blame in, in times of, of, of public health crises and other crises. I think that was pretty powerful to show that the kind of uh, interests that we were trying to, uh, trying to forward? Yeah, I thought that was an important point as well. And one that it really it kind of drew in sharp relief the, not just the inappropriateness, but kind of the dirtiness of what Governor Cuomo was doing, right? You have people who are frightened, frightened for their lives. And you have the state's governor repeatedly getting on TV and blaming a small uh, religious group for the spread, saying that these are the people you should blame. These, this is where the problem's coming from. And that's, that's dangerous. And it, it's, it's a type of danger that we actually saw manifested and that you had people acting in an aggressive way toward, uh, ways towards Orthodox Jews in, in New York City. That's just, that's not the right way to handle this kind of thing. And it's very good that U.S. Supreme Court took the kind of uh, steps that it did. Uh, Miles, can you talk about the angle that you took in the amicus brief that you filed uh, regarding kind of some of the public ramifications to the way they, they not just Governor Cuomo, but other governors across the the country uh, were acting. 
Sure. So, uh, yeah, th this argument that we made, and I think uh, this was true of, of a handful of the other amici, including, you know, Misha, the ones you mentioned a second ago, that talked a little bit about some of the broader, in some ways almost policy-esque ramifications of the court's decision, was the fact that, excuse me, when you've got these sort of uh, unequal, discriminatory, uh, sort of double standard standards, like what Governor Cuomo and then in Nevada, Governor Sisolak and, and some others have put in place, sh sure, it, it's legally unsupportable, right? The parties covered that pretty thoroughly in their briefing. But also, one of the, the argument that we made, one of the perverse consequences of that is that it makes it very clear to the public, right? When you see, and I'm skipping around a little bit, when you see Governor Newsom telling everybody not to go to Thanksgiving dinner, and then he's going to a big party at the French Laundry and you know, whining and dining his friends, when California health officials are flying to Hawaii while telling everybody to stay home, clearly the public sees that and they think, these rules are a joke. These rules aren't real, right? So it, it degrades public confidence, public trust, and as a result, public compliance, willingness to comply with the rules that are legitimate, right? When you when you when you sprinkle in these the, the handful of outlier jurisdictions that are using these double standards, it means that everybody else becomes suspicious of the, the good rules, right? And there's uh, there's evidence from uh, you know in, in various social study journals, public health journals from prior instances, right? Like the Ebola outbreak and things like that, supporting that point. <laughs> Excuse me. So that that was I think you know one of the and, and again, right, you always, as, as an amicus, you always hope that the Supreme Court will like your point so much that they cite to your brief. But uh, yet, yet another swing and a miss for me. Uh, <laughs> though, 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 a, though a handful of the, of the opposing amici, I think, did get cited, as I recall, by, I think, Justice Sotomayor uh, cited a handful of maybe some medical practitioner uh, briefs. Uh, so there, 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 there were a few that got cited, uh, but, but unfortunately, uh, not this. Let me let me ask another question, and Misha, you mentioned this very briefly in passing earlier, um, where in in a handful of these cases, including uh, in, in yours from New York, Governor Cuomo, uh, correct timing here, but I think it was literally, I think it was the day, the night before his reply brief was due, he he sort of engaged in this, in this backpedaling maneuver, purports to lift or at least lighten the restrictions on the gerrymandered. Uh, red zones, and then file, pr proceeds to file a brief saying, "Ah, nothing to see here. It's moot. I, uh, I, I lightened the load here." Uh, was that something that was anticipated? Uh, right? It, it seems like it's happened uh, in New York, both in in this case and others, and a few other jurisdictions. Uh, and what's the sort of what's the, the the counter argument? Why do you think the court didn't find that uh, to be a a mooting event? Yeah, so obviously New York, both state and city have tried to pull this move before. Uh, they did it to success in the, in the handgun case that the, that the Supreme Court had granted. I think the difference here was um, Governor Cuomo was so arrogant that he didn't want to repeal uh, the entire cluster initiative. He just changed uh, some of the color-coded zones for the time being. And since he didn't repeal the entire initiative, um, and since he has unlimited discretion to issue it at any time, I think the court, at least the majority of the court, was not uh, was not taken with that move. You know, it is a little, you know, it is disappointing that the Chief Justice um, and Justice Breyer did want to allow Governor Cuomo to evade their review in this manner, in this very transparent manner. There was no objective basis on when, for him to change uh, the the zones at the time and in the manner that he did. It was there's no serious argument that it was done for for any reason except for to evade Supreme Court review. Uh, and that's also what, what happened in New York with the gun with the gun situation. But here, because he didn't repeal the whole thing, the court uh, stood up and, and did the right thing. And I think it'll be important precedent to cite even outside the COVID area in circumstances where the government does less than repeal the entire law, that the, the, the relief is still necessary. I know the yeah, people that's... face that kind of stuff all the time. Well, I, I think that's right. I mean, one of the things that we face in civil liberties litigation and the kind of litigation that Misha has been talking about is this kind of strategic mooting efforts. And so it really is valuable that the Supreme Court saw through that. And it really helped that you had the governor refusing not only to repeal the entire uh, targeting scheme, but also saying, I can snap it back into place anytime I want. 
And uh, it, it's that's like the dictionary definition of uh, capable of repetition but evading review. So it really it, it made it difficult for him to go there. Um, Misha, can you talk to us a little bit about what's happened since your win in the diocese case? You know, there's been obviously there's been a, a couple of cases that have been remanded by the U.S. Supreme Court uh, all the way to uh, district court level. There have been um, there have been some some other cases that are I think there's one right now that's on the waiting. We're all kind of waiting to see what the Supreme Court's going to do with it. Can you talk to us about what's going on with those? Yeah, well, the case that's way in there is a, 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 a case out of Kentucky that's very similar, really, to our successful uh, Madison school case in state court, uh, where we got our schools reopened. Now, we had a much easier time in Wisconsin because we had the, 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 the strict scrutiny standard, even if everything is neutral, just from a burden on religious exercise because the Wisconsin rejected um, Smith for Sherbert. Uh, in, in the uh, Kentucky case, their, their challenge is to show that there is a, that, that, that a, a, a school closure order that closes both religious and non-religious schools is still discriminatory against religion because it allows other non-school entities to open. And you know, it, it really is a, an interesting question within the Justice Kavanaugh framework about what is the what is the comparator? Is the comparator you know, all secular activity or is it the nearest neighbor? Because obviously in that case, the nearest neighbor would appear to be you know, secular schools. On the other hand, all kinds of other secular institutions that appear less dangerous than schools. And schools are not dangerous at all, in fact, as the data has showed, are, are open. So it's a really, it's an interesting edge case. Uh, the other cases that are going on are less edge cases. You know, we had the, uh, the Calvary Chapel decision from the Ninth Circuit two days ago relying on the diocese case. We've all, the other ones, you know, we haven't had any decisions that I'm aware of that actually finally adjudicate new cases in light of diocese. You know, I, you know, I'm, I do a bunch of these cases. Obviously I've filed a lot of supplemental authority in 20 HA letters the day after the day after Thanksgiving, talking about this case, filed one in my disability case, filed one in my, you know, school cases. Um, with, I saw an order from a district judge in New York uh, in a case where a bunch of artists were challenging Governor Cuomo's restrictions on their performative art, saying, well, if the governor can't signal out religious practice uh, for disabled treatment, well, how can he signal out um, artistic First Amendment practice? So we'll see what the judge does. That'll work its way through. Um, obviously, we, we, when you're in the heartland, you have houses of worship being discriminated against versus secular institutions. You should have a pretty easy lift there, assuming that you have a fair court. Once you get further away from that core application of the diocese case, you're gonna we're gonna see how the courts do it. But I think at minimum, the days of um, South Bay and Jacobson as being a blank check for the government bureaucrats are over. Uh, if you do lose some of those cases, it will be for other reasons. It won't be because of a reflexive citation to South Bay or Jacobson. Now, outside of maybe if you challenge a mandatory vaccination laws, then you might have a, a Jacobson problem. But outside of that, talking about enumerated constitutional rights, a normal constitutional law should um, should return um, to to your courthouse. Let me, let me, let me ask you, oh, go ahead, Miles. Let me let me ask you a follow up to kind of to to riff off of that a little bit. One of the questions uh, from our faithful viewers. Uh, side note, if you have questions of your own, send them through the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to get through as many as we can. One of the questions was, this is similar to what you're saying, right? As you start to, to sort of move away from the, the core holding uh, of Diocese of Brooklyn, um, how, how does the analysis change, right? To what extent is it, is it weaker? So, for example, let's say you've got municipal ordinances that treat small businesses in a disproportionately burdensome way as compared to big box retailers. How, how much traction do they get out of Diocese of Brooklyn uh, and, and, and how much are they just out of luck? Yeah, you know, I mean, look, you're going to probably have a tough time if you can't invoke any enumerated constitutional right or even, you know, a right deeply grounded in Supreme Court precedent. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side of the federal society you talk to, uh, the, the right to earn an honest living. Um, as protected by the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the Due Process Clause, or the Ninth Amendment, has not gotten a lot of respect in courts well before the pandemic, you know, at least since the 1930s. 
So when you're talking about unenumerated constitutional rights, like the right to earn a, an honest living, uh, you're probably going to have a tough time in front of most judges and most panels, because of course, any judge on the left of center is just going to, they're, they're in the mood of largely giving a blank check to governments. And we, within our ranks, we have a division between, let's say, the Bar Randy Barnett wing of the Federal Society and the Robert Bork wing of the Federal Society about what you do with unenumerated constitutional rights. And it's certainly hard to count to five at the Supreme Court to protect un unenumerated constitutional rights. I would suggest if you want to litigate in defense of small businesses that are being unfairly targeted in this time, that you consider creatively what other kinds of claims, what state law claims you could bring in their behalf. The case I argued earlier today, we had a state administrative law argument in defense of bars and restaurants in Wisconsin that has been so far successful. Uh, we certainly didn't bring any economic due process type of challenge of the kind that we would need to bring into federal court. So it's gonna take some creative lawyering as you get further away from enumerated constitutional rights and to more, um, vague constitutional provisions or or not even constitutional provisions at all but rather just your your own sense of justice so let me let me drill in a little bit on this comparator issue because i think it's really fascinating it's one of the important things that the diocese decision does um the two of the arguments that new york made were one you know we're not we're we're treating other places of public assembly as bad as we're treating churches right so you don't need to worry about it. We're treating other people, at least some other people, as bad as we're treating you, churches who are shutting down. Um, and then another argument they would say is, you know, the ones you're trying to compare yourself to are, are different. They're, they rate, you know, you want to compare yourself to a bike shop or a liquor store, and that's different from a house of worship. How did the Supreme Court deal with those those arguments? Yeah, I mean, the Supreme Court made a couple of references to this and said that there's no there's no reason to sh to think that we what we are currently doing and the generally applicable rules are not safe i think we saw more of this in justice kavanaugh's separate opinion and he's got this theory which i think would be quite uh, important for religious exercise and i mentioned this earlier is that if once you start making exceptions from a generally applicable prohibition on gathering then uh, it's most like a, almost like a first favored nation status um, from trade is that religion has to be within the category of most exempted as opposed to somewhere in the middle. Now, as I mentioned with regard to the discussion of the Kentucky case, it can be tricky. What is, what is the comparator? Is it the nearest neighbor or is it all exceptions when you have less near neighbors? And that's really where the rubber is going to hit the road. And I'll be very interested to see where the Kentucky decision comes out. And my hunch is if the Kentucky, if the Kentucky schools win, that's great. But if they lose, I think it's going to be a very narrow uh, reasoning of, of based on nearest neighbor. So we'll be really interested to see where the Kentucky case comes out on that, because that's going to give us a lot of guidance for the future. And I think one of the, you know, to kind of flesh out the <laughs> Kentucky case and the nearest neighbor question there, that Misha is correct that the, the private schools, other private schools have been shut down in addition to the religious ones. And uh, the argument the religious schools are making is, okay, fine, you shut down the schools, but you didn't shut down the racetracks. Mm -hmm. And while we can't have a, a single get kid go to school, even though, as Misha was saying earlier, studies show they're not a source of, of significant transmission, you can do school in a way that's safe. You can go to the racetrack and gamble all day. And not just 10 people, not just 25 people, but up to 250 people using the uh, occupancy restrictions that are applicable to them. And, uh, and so there's, this, there's a sense that, you know, if the government's interest is in trying to restrict transmission of COVID, that's the comparator, right? And that's, I think that's where the Supreme Court went in diocese. And I think it's going to have a, a sharper, a cleaner question to address it, uh, potentially on the nose in the Kentucky cases. And it'll make it make it a really clear decision. And what's pretty in, really interesting too is we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of movement by the court since its diocese decisions. Remained a couple of cases back down, uh, it, reversing bad rulings out of the Ninth Circuit and out of the Third Circuit or the New Jersey uh, Supreme Court, I think. And um, so there's there's a couple different places where it sent the cases back down and said it's time to reconsider in light of our prior, prior decision. That Kentucky case though has been sitting there now for a couple of weeks. And it seems likely that whatever we get is going to be something that's more than just a perfunctory order. Um, yeah, but this what, is, I, 
So what I will say on that is this comparator question is really interesting and it's important for COVID and it's important in a lot of context. But I think that the ultimate end game that we need to be working towards, and I know you guys are going to agree, is the robust protection of religious liberty that adhered in this country before the terrible decision in Smith. Uh, because ultimately, if you are a religious adherent, you don't really care that much that the church, that the track is open. What the problem is, is that you can't worship. Yeah. And what we, you know, I just, and the reason it's so on top of my mind is I, last week, I just argued a case in a jurisdiction that you don't have Smith. You have the old Sherbert rule, the correct rule, the one that I believe the Supreme Court is trending towards. And there, during my argument, I didn't really have to worry about the comparators too much. The entire argument was, is this a, is this a really sincere religious belief? Do you really need to be, uh, do you really need to be in person uh, in congregate prayer when you're, when you're doing schooling? And do they satisfy strict scrutiny? Now the comparator question can come in a little bit in strict scrutiny. Why are you shutting down this or not and the other thing? But I think our ultimate end goal for those who believe in religious liberty especially you know once the pandemic's over don't take your eye off the ball we have to keep pushing to overturn smith and to get back to the sherbert standard because that makes it much cleaner to litigate these cases as those of us who do get to litigate under sherbert have seen that's that's definitely true that's definitely true and it's not you know part of the reason why we got smith was that there was a concern that the sky would fall right if we allowed those religious people to be protected in their religious exercise and one of the one of the data points that we have since that decision over 30 years ago or about 30 years ago is that we have the RIFRA standard, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that was passed overwhelmingly uh, by the federal government. And the sky hasn't fallen. And, you know, there's some complaints that's really, you know, used just to protect majoritarian religion and things like that. But in fact, studies have shown that it's overwhelmingly used by religious minorities, by mom and pop sort of situations, by prisoners and folks like that, uh, but whether it's RIFRA or RELUPA. Uh, the companion law that protects uh, prisoners and, and houses of worship. You know, these are these are used to protect minority faith groups that aren't that aren't well understood or well accommodated by bureaucrats. You know, Misha and Bright tell you about this a lot as well. A lot of times, the issue isn't the kind of targeted uh, animus that you you saw reflected by Governor Cuomo. The issue is that the gov the the bureaucrats don't have time for you. They're not paying attention to you. So, like in Kentucky, the the racetracks had the ear of the governor. And the private religious schools didn't, and that's what was happening. It wasn't. It was more bureaucratic ignorance and bureaucratic animosity. But you need you need that that strong RIFRA standard, that strong Sherbert standard, that gets you to strict scrutiny once you have a religious belief that's being burdened to protect against those kind of situations. Now, Daniel, do you have? I mean, do you have the? Have you guys been working up the case for this? You know, in Wisconsin. The case that rejected Smith for Sherbert was the best possible fact scenario. It was Amish people who didn't want to put slow moving decal things on the back of their cars. Obviously, they would lose under Smith. But I mean, the, the Amish people are saying we're going to have to move out of Wisconsin because we religiously can't put the slow, slow moving decal sign on the back of our horse and buggy. And the Supreme Court unanimously there said, well, we're just not going to have that kind of rule in the state. So, what is the status of the the litigation into finding that kind of case to bring to the Supreme Court to get this terrible Smith case overturned? Well, that's a, that's a great question. There are, there are actually a couple of vehicles. One that's currently being considered by the Supreme Court, um, which yeah, is the Fulton versus City of Philadelphia case that, that has a lot of free exercise questions in it, including one that could address Smith squarely. Another one that's, that's currently sitting on the Supreme Court's doorstep is the Ricks versus Idaho case. And this is a case actually similar to what Misha was just describing, where a, um, a minority faith group uh, is someone who, uh, not, I mean, they, they uh, are identify as Christian, but have my, minority beliefs as it regards use of uh, social security and social security numbers. And in the state of Idaho, if you don't use a social security number, you can't become a licensed contractor. And so there's an individual who was terminated from position and is trying to get, you know, a licensed contracting job. He'd worked in it for quite some time. And there are uh, and he was, but he can't, and so he can't do his livelihood without violating his religious beliefs. It's a very, very easy thing for the, the state to accommodate. They could just use any number of other types of um, identifiers for him, but they're not willing to. And so the guy has lost his, uh, his ability to do his job, and he's frankly lost his ability to take care of his family. And like, you know, he, he hasn't gone to the dentist in a while because he can't afford to. You know, those kind of situations are real life situations. 
And this is the kind of pain that the, the Smith decision causes when you have a, you know, a situation like we do in Idaho where we don't, we're stuck under a Smith type standard. So that case is in front of the U.S. Supreme Court and could be resolved by them to, to clean up the Smith problem. We are in the last three minutes of our time together. So let me just go ahead and encourage folks to put in their, for the final time, their name and their bar number into the Q&A section or to shoot me an email with it. And, um, and then we'll make sure we get you credit. Uh, any final questions or thoughts, um, Miles and Misha? Let me, let me sling a couple of questions at you just since. Uh, so I, I, I apologize, so Miles. I do have a hard stop uh, in two minutes, so sure. I, I'm not going to be able to answer a couple of questions. <laughs> but so, so give me your best one. All right. You've got, you've got uh, less than 120 seconds. You talked a little bit earlier about even within the federal society ranks, right, sort of the Randy Barnett versus the, board, the division over, over some of these unenumerated rights. The question is, and I'm interpreting because I think Siri respelled some of it, do we really want to encourage the Supreme Court to delve into the world of unenumerated rights and give unelected lawyers that sort of power? Yeah, I mean, this is going to, this is, you know, obviously we have other kind of fissures that are arising, but this has been the core fissure in the Federalist Society over the last 15 years. There are, in my judgment, strong originalist and practical arguments in both directions. Um, you know, I, I really think that it, it's, it shows the diversity of our legal movement that you're not gonna have, I don't think you're gonna, we're gonna have uniform agreement uh, with among our folks on that. I think that's just a very core disagreement that a lot of people have and they have good reasons for it on both sides. But since we are in the last 30 seconds, I will do the thing that I do at the end of all of this. All of these is please sue governors, please sue local bureaucrats. We need to have more of these lawsuits. You guys, most of the federal side of people are lawyers. We're not seeing enough lawsuits. We have a real opportunity here, especially after the diocese case, to get important case law established uh, before the vaccine makes this moot and allows these terrible decisions that have been issued over the last couple of months to lie around like loaded guns for bureaucrats to be used in the future. Misha, we can't thank you enough. Thank you so much, not just for talking to us, but for your way in the diocese case. Thank you everybody for attending and we will go ahead and wrap up. Bye y'all.